This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Be seated. Well, our scriptural lesson for today comes from the 16th division of Psalm and verse 11 in the New King James Version. Notice this, these familiar words. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're talking today about the path of life, the path of life. This is a declaration that God, you will make known uh, your path of life to us. The path of life, other versions say the path to life. And it is indeed a path to life. And this path to life always points us to God because God is the source of all living things. Even when we call ourselves making clones of something, we don't have the power to initiate life. So we have to take something that is alive and then work from that because God is the source of all life. He's the life giver. It was God that breathed into mankind the breath of life and man became a living soul. A soul must receive life in order to live. A spirit gives life. The spirit quickens. It makes alive. And God leads us to the path of life. And so that's what we're talking about today is the path of life. The old English word path is a narrow passageway or a route across land. It's a track that is worn by the feet of people or the feet of animals treading it. You tread a path, you tread a path. And I want you to see that a path deals with at least four different things. A path deals with plans, plans. We know that God said, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Because a path uh, is required by a plan. If you've got a plan to do something, when you have plans, if you've got plans to go to Disney World, you have to then create the path. Are we going to fly or are we going to drive? If we're going to drive, we've got to chart the path going down 75 south from Atlanta to Orlando. You've got to chart the path because plans need a path. If you're going to become a teacher, if you're going to become an accountant, if you're going to become a doctor or an architect, you have to chart the path. What's my path to getting there? It's not enough just to say, I want to be this or that or the other. What's your path? What path are you going to take to implement your plan? So a path requires a plan. It requires a plan. It also requires a purpose. It requires a purpose. It requires a plan. It requires a purpose. And, and, and I want you to realize that the purpose uh, for a path is to get you from this place to that place, it, it, taking the best course of action. The best course of action. I'm so glad that God has plans for us. You know why? Because he knew that we would mess up and that's why God had already made a plan to be able to fix our mess ups. That's why the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world because he knew that mankind, that we would miss it. So before you had a problem, God had a plan. Before you had a problem, God had a plan. Paths require plans. Paths require purpose. Purpose because it has to be created for a purpose. You don't just create a path for no purpose. A path has a purpose. And one of those purposes is that the, plas, number th the, the, plan, uh, the path number three brings us to a place. It brings us to a place. You have plans, purpose, place. Paths always lead to a destination. A path leads 
to a place. It leads somewhere. It, it, it leads into uh, green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. It leads to a destination. You're not just going for a walk. You're not just taking a dinner cruise that doesn't have a particular destination. It's going to bring you back to the same place that you got on. So what, when God sends you on a path, it's going to take you on a journey. And that journey is going to introduce you to various things. So a, a path deals with plans. It deals with purpose. It deals with place. And then fourthly, it deals with people. Whenever you see a path, it means that somebody else has gone before you. And then it also means that others can now come after you because that's what a path does. It's about people. It involves people. You're going to meet people on your journey and there are certain things that you don't know and that you don't need to know until you get to the fork in the road and God's going to have a person planted there on your journey. And there are certain people that you are not destined to meet until you get to a certain place on the journey. I wonder why I haven't found my husband, why I haven't found my wife. Keep walking on your journey. Keep moving. Keep doing what you know to do because they are planted on your journey. They are planted on your journey. They are planted on your journey. And so as you are doing what you need to do, uh, it, it was interesting that Ruth found her husband while she was busy at work. She was working on a plan. She was working the field. She was serving somebody else. She wasn't self-serving. She was serving her mother-in-law. And she's out with a heart just doing something. She's working on something. And then she gets noticed. She wasn't just sitting somewhere praying. She's, she's on her journey. She's on her journey. And, and the Bible says that Boaz left handfuls of stuff on purpose. On purpose. Had she not been on the journey to pick up what was left on purpose... You don't even know what God has left on purpose for you by people that he's already given you favor with until you walk in obedience to him. And so this is why when you have a path, the path is going to deal with plans and it has purpose and it leads you to a place and it involves people. And sometimes you're the one who blazes a path for others to follow. And other times you're following a path and it is indicating that others have come before you and that others will come after you. That's what a path says to us. And then you will discover this great truth is that the greatest lessons of life are not learned in a course. They are learned on a course. They're learned on a journey. It's when you're on a journey, when you're hanging around Big Mama's house, that you learn how to do some things that you will never learn out of a textbook. Uh, you know, before they had YouTube, you know, you wondered how we knew how to do things. Oh, we could do things all right. Because you, 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 you spent time with your grandparents. And, and, and they didn't let you sleep in. You got up when they got up. And, uh, and you learn to do things, whether you want it to or not. They didn't ask you how you feel and whether you need to check in on your social media. They just, get up, bad boy, come on. Get up, gal, come on in here. They taught you how to do things. You learn to do by doing. You learn to do by doing. So you learn on a course. Your greatest lessons of life are learned on a course, not merely in a course. I'm just telling you, my real education didn't finish until I finished school. And then I've been on a course of life. It's, in, you know, in, in, in traveling the world, the whole world is a course. Uh, the world is, a, is like a giant textbook. And he who travels, she who travels only reads one page. But when you go on the journey, you're going to learn things that are on the journey because God has things planted on your journey. He has trouble on your journey to develop you challenges on your journey to build strength in you. He didn't just make everything where you wouldn't find any obstacles. Life is not a sprint. It is a marathon with hurdles and curves. And you have to walk with God and trust him every single day in order to be able to navigate this thing that we call the journey of life, the path of life uh, successfully. And there's so many new things that pop up in the world, but the Bible has told us that there's nothing new under the sun. 
nothing new under heaven. So whenever people start offering you a new path, ask, will this path lead me closer to the Lord or farther from him? I'll never forget, we had a man that grew up in our church, and uh, in the church where I grew up, rather, and uh, he and his family were a wonderful, godly family, rooted, grounded in the church, and all of a sudden, he got a promotion uh, to go and work for an oil company over in Texas, and he got over there, and he got away from his spiritual grounding and foundations in his life, and his life fell to pieces, and his marriage fell to pieces, his family disintegrated. And he, what looked like a, pro, a promotion, because he didn't check with God, assuming that if this is more money, but life is more than money. Life is relationships. Relationships are the currency of life, and when you stay connected to the right kinds of people, then the right things will happen in your life. And he got disconnected from the place where God established him because paths lead to places, and they connect you to people. And he left the place and the people. And I'm not saying that, that there are not times that God will say that your, your, your time up is here and now you're to go there. And if you walk and trust me in this new place, I'll pro- lead you to a new place and I'll bring other people into your life. But paths have purpose and they lead you to a place and they connect you with people. God has a plan. He has a plan, and as we trust him, he's going to make this journey exciting. It's it's filled with with inquiry. He he has so much planted on the journey for you to discover, to discover. Just think about this. Treasure is hidden, and he wants us to unearth it on the journey. Notice Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not just some of it. Do not depend on your own understanding. And I know some of you are control freaks. You want to figure everything out. You want to know what's going to happen at point A and point B and point C and when we're going to do this and when you're going to do that. Don't depend on your own understanding. You want to make sure that before you leave, before you start, before you get in, you've done a background check, you've you've, you've, uh, you've run that credit and all of this. Don't depend on your own understanding. You can run the credit, you can run the background check, and they can still be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You can still wind up with Satan himself. Don't depend on your own understanding because it can look good to you. Everything look good. Carol, I don't want to mess this up. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take, which means that there are a lot of good-looking paths. It means that there are other alternate paths. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. There are a variety of paths, and that's why you have to walk with God. You have to walk closely with God. If you are going to be able to follow the path of life, you must learn how to listen to his voice. You have to listen to his voice if you'll ever read it about it in in, uh, Psalms chapter 81 and verse 8. It talks about the importance of listening to God. You can't walk with God if you don't learn how to listen to him. You can't walk with God if you don't learn how to listen to him. And so he says, walk with me. We walk by faith and not by sight. You got to listen to him along the way. Listen to him along the way. God's leading us and he's guiding us and he's taking us on on an awesome adventure. Life is an adventure. It is filled with treasures of, of things that, that, that your uh, inquiring mind should, should want to discover along the journey. God puts the hunger in us. He puts the quest in us to be able to know various things. But I want you to understand this. God does not require us to understand his will. Just trust it and obey it, even if it seems unreasonable. Even if it seems unreasonable, just trust it. He doesn't require you to understand his will. But I don't understand why the Lord wants me to leave here and to go over there. God doesn't require you to understand his will. Just trust and obey it, even if it seems unreasonable. Now, this is when you know that this is God. Uh, You know that God is talking to you. You remember Abraham knew that God was telling him, take your son Isaac and sacrifice him up on Mount Moriah. And God... God knew that Abraham was going to have a challenge with that, and it tried everything in Abraham's soul, but Abraham didn't understand it, but he obeyed it. He didn't understand it, but he obeyed it, and God was saying, can you trust me? 
Can you trust me? You show that you trust somebody when you can go alone, even if you don't understand it. And that this, is, this is with God. This is a trust that, that we reserve for God. But he doesn't require us to understand his will. He, he expects us to trust him and obey him. And I want you to notice how he dealt with Joshua. God spoke to Joshua, and he gave a command to Joshua to give to the priest. And notice what he said in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 8. Joshua, give this command to the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. Now God says, listen, he says, tell the priest, go to the banks of the Jordan River and take a few steps into the river and stop there. I've reminded you of this. God not only orders your steps, he orders your stops. And you have to trust him when God is telling you to step down into something that is unstable. Are you listening? Every time that you obey God in a dream or, or through to fulfill a vision, you're stepping into something that is unstable. You always step out of comfort into discomfort and then find yourselves in greater comfort. You step out of stability into instability into greater stability. It's a pattern of God, but God says, you got to trust me. Trust me. Trust me even when you can't trace what I'm doing. Even when you don't understand my, my, my will. Trust my voice. Trust my heart toward you that I have plans for you of what you know not of. Plans for good and not for evil that no matter what it is I trust him I trust that God will cause all things to work together for my good Romans 8 28 I know I know I, if I'm ever concerned about uh, this uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 I am strengthened in my soul when I look back to say that I still have hope in God. He brought us through the Spanish flu, didn't he? Of uh, 1918 to 1920. He brought us through that. He brought us through the swine flu. He brought us through that. He brought us through World War II. He brought us through World War I. He brought us through 9-11, the same God that's able to bring us through tragedy. You will live through this hope. Thou in God. Hope Thou in God, just look back over what the Lord has done. We can trust him because he's got a reputation of where he's been faithful. If you don't know him in your own life, look back into your grandmama's life and see the same God that brought them with less education than what you have. My God, anybody know what I'm talking about? Who didn't have the kind of money and kind of resume that you have? And if God was able to bless them to be able to send you to school, my God, my God, my God, Lord, if you could do that back then, what can you do now? You got to be able to trust him when you can't trace him, when you don't understand his will. You got to know that God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. And he said, I want you to just go to the banks of the river and take a few steps in and stop. And he never explained himself. But I want you to see why. Notice what happened when they trusted and obeyed God. In, in Joshua chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. It was the harvest season. And the Jordan was overflowing its bank. It's just running over flooding. But as soon as the feet of the priest who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge. The water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam. Which is near Zarathon. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea uh, until the riverbed was dry. And then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. God caused all of the waters that were before where they were to not merely stop but to back up. But I tell you that when God is leading you, he'll come to some stuff that's about trying to put you over your head and say, back up. And the waters... The water's backed up. And then everything that was ahead of it, where the water was flowing, it flowed down to the Dead Sea. I've been to the Dead Sea. It is the lowest point on the earth. That's why stuff flows into it, but it never flows out. And that's why no life can live in the Dead Sea, because there's no outlet for what flows in. And if you hold what God has given to you, you will die. 
You're designed to give it away. You're designed to give it away. You're designed to give it away. And God backed it up and he stopped it. And he did this when the priest obeyed him, even when they didn't understand him. He says, go down to the banks of the river and take a few steps in. As soon as their feet touched, the waters started backing up. And there are some things that God will never start working on your behalf until you bust a move. Until you put your feet in the water. He doesn't talk to people who are just satisfied to stay on the safety of the shore. You got to get your feet in the water. When you get in the water, God will send his power. Certain things don't happen happen until you get in the water. You'll build the ark by faith, but you, God will not float your boat until the water touches it. There are some things that you've been waiting on God to do, and he's been waiting on you. Get in the water! Get in the water! Get in the water! I know you didn't realize that the path would involve water, but it does. There are some things that you can't walk on. you got to swim in. Your path will take you along journeys that you had never banked on. And you'll have to come and trust him in the journey to step out into something that is unstable. Water speaks of instability. And when you're going to walk with God, God will put you into some situations that feel very unstable when you first get there. But once you put your feet in the water, he'll back some things up and make the way here where this will flow on down and you'll be able to cross on dry land and you didn't understand and God was like, I'm God. And even if I told you all what was going to happen, you wouldn't have believed me, so I spared you the details because you couldn't handle it. You're in some things right now and had God told you that you would go through everything that you've been through right now, you never would have signed up for the journey. You would have said, Lord, if I'd known that they were going to die. Lord, if I'd known that I was going to wind up divorced, I never would have married to begin with. There are certain things that God never designed to tell you because you would have said, no, thank you, no, sir, not me, not now, not ever. And so God will just withhold the details because you get ready to launch out into something. And he'll never tell you about people that will use you and people that will lie on you, and people that will file suit against you. He'll never tell you about the midnight oil that you're going to have to burn. He will never tell you about how tired that you will become, and how sometimes you'll be so weary in your soul that you'll be ready to throw in the towel. There are certain things that God will never tell you ahead of time. He'll never tell you that your family will sometimes work against you. He'll never tell you that. He won't tell you that. He never told Joseph that his brothers were going to betray him. He never told him that Potiphar's wife was going to lie on him and that he would wind up in prison. God only showed him the palace. God doesn't show you what you're going to go through. He's going to show you what you're going to go to. He has a plan. God's got a plan. Just trust him, trust him. But on the journey, on the journey, I'm just telling you, God built trouble on your journey to build the faith uh, that is necessary to sustain you when you arrive. And as soon as you, move, uh, you think that you've arrived, God moves the target. It's amazing. But he leads us. You see again in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6 in the New King James Version, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. He shall direct your paths. Uh, another version said that he will make your paths smooth or he'll make your paths straight. Now some people have gotten the idea from that that if you just follow God, that your whole life will be smooth. Everything will be straight and direct, and that's not what it's saying at all. That, that, that word there, that he shall direct your paths, direct and straight, it actually speaks of ethical and moral uprightness. That I'm going to make your path morally upright. I'm going to give you an, an integrous journey to where you'll be able to do this thing in an upright way. That It doesn't mean that there won't be challenges and there won't be curves there that you can't see around. It's not always straight. There'll be some things that you'll have to trust God around the curve. You'll have to lean with him in the curve because he'll take you through things. Remember, life is, is a marathon and it's got hurdles that you have to go over and hills to climb and it's got curves to go around. It's not just a straight journey. You don't just go here and then there. There are a whole lot of crooks and turns that your life will make it as you're following God. And that's why as he led the children of Israel, he didn't take them in a straight way. They went in circles. They went in circles. It wasn't straight, but God was with them and God was leading them and they were going in circles. Have you ever felt that your life was just going around in a circle and you're doing the same old thing and I'm in the same place and here 10 years down the road? Maybe God's trusting your character to see where you'll be faithful. And, and, and I, I, let me just tell you this. On the journey, it's not always God's not trying to test to see whether you're successful but whether you're faithful. Are you listening? There's a huge difference. 
Because it may not look like you got successful and got finished. You have to understand that this life that we run, it's like a relay race. You don't finish it. You can finish your course, but you don't finish it. You got to pass the baton that you've been running with to someone else and somebody else will finish it. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God could not finish what he was doing in Abraham alone. He couldn't finish it in Isaac alone. He finished it in Jacob. There are certain things that God will never finish in your life. And so he's testing your faithfulness. Can I trust you to be faithful to get this package that I have entrusted in your hands delivered to the next person who will then carry it and deliver it? That's why he chose Abraham, because he knew that Abraham would be a man that would be faithful to teach his children and command his household after him. He was looking for faithfulness, not success. Faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He, he's not looking for success. That's a worldly understanding. God's looking for faithfulness. Were you faithful to carry what I gave you to carry for the time that I gave you to carry? And did you hand it off to somebody else where they could take it farther than what you had the ability to take it? You hand it off. You hand it off. But you have to be faithful to carry it. If you're not faithful, you'll end up fumbling and dropping the baton and disqualifying yourself in the race. You have to run your race, your segment of the race. But this journey is something that you may not finish. You finish your course. Somebody else will finish the remainder. And I want you to see that the Bible is a pathway leading to Jesus Christ. That's what it is. The Bible, it is a pathway leading to Jesus Christ. When you understand the book, he comes in the volume of the book. He's not just known in any one verse. All of the whole Bible speaks of Jesus. And uh, it really confirms the awesomeness of God because if it were a fad, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't last but a year or two or five or ten years. And when that leader dies, it dies off. But Jesus, my God, when Jesus died, the church exploded. That thing began to spread like wildfire. Not only uh, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was Jesus Christ concealed. The New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. And it is showing, and it is amazing that he makes himself known through the volume of the book. Uh, this book that was written over a period of approximately 1,500 years by at least 40 different authors, at least 40 different authors, all saying the same thing, prophesying to the same Jesus Christ that would come 40 people over 1,500 year period in three different languages, Hebrew. Greek, Aramaic, and now they're all pointing to Jesus in different tribes and different languages. People that lived in different epochs, in different eras, they, they all were testifying that this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus, this prophesied about a man that was coming because Jesus comes in the volume of the book. The Bible is a pathway to Jesus Christ. We, we, we get the whole word bibliography, it's like a Bible, it's a collection of books collection of books. The bibliography, when you're writing a book, your bibliography is the reference of all of the academic books and whatever that you've used in it to help you to form your thoughts. You've taken quotes and ideas and you're giving credit to that in your bibliography, the collection of the books that have helped to shape your thinking. Whenever a person reads your, goes into your personal library, if they could see it, they are seeing then a bibliography, a collection of books that has formed your thinking, your ideas, your personal philosophy, your worldview. They are getting an understanding of how you think and why you think. They are looking at it and understanding how your thoughts became formed. And this is where Joshua, he, he, he told them to lay these stones of remembrance, stones of remembrance there so that the people could be able to remember. Uh, I would call that an anthology. It's very similar sometimes to the word pathology. When you look at the cause and the effect of disease, you're really looking at the origin. What, where did this come from? What caused this person's death? You're, you're going back on a journey trying to figure out what caused this. The pathology, there's a path that leads to death. And it's discovering the path. It's discovering the path and saying, come, let's go on a journey. And that's why it bothers me sometimes when people are highly successful and they said, I did it, you can do it too. 
but they never show you their anthology. They never said that I was up all night and I was worried to myself sick and I, I gave them, I took every dime that I had. I had to borrow money out of my 401k in order to launch it into my business to get started and there was a, so much risk and I had so much anxiety during this time and people who said that they were going to help me walked out on me. And then I had people that stole from me and then I had this to happen. And they don't give you the whole anthology as to exactly how it was built and what was going through your mind. They need to lay the stones of remembrance here to say this is what was happening. This is what was happening. And then I did this and then I did that and then I did the other. You find people that sing well. They didn't just roll out of bed like that and all of a sudden, bam, here it is. You don't find people that have become virtuosos on, on the keyboard or on, on, on a horn, on, on, on the percussion instruments. You, you don't find them on the stringed instruments that have become a virtuoso if you really want an anthology to discover how they have been able to develop the skill to be able to play so masterfully. And, and it's hours a day of practice, some boring kind of stuff, going over scales and learning modulation of the diatonic scales and this particular kinds of thing. They're learning things over and over and over and over. And it is through the repetition that a path toward excellence is created and you need to show people the anthology the path the path if you can't deconstruct it you can't construct it and that's where you have to bring it down and deconstruct the path so you can construct it and and then it helps us to come to a greater understanding but I want you to realize this not all paths lead to the same place. Some people are just thinking that, you know, if you, if you just treat people right and all of the paths will lead to the same place. Not so. Jesus said, I am the way. You know, there are other religions. Islam says that Muhammad, Allah, you know, that's, that's the way. They don't preach that as a way. They preach it as the way. Christianity is an exclusive religion. It's an exclusive about a relationship with one person, Jesus Christ, who claimed to be the way, the truth, the life. It's an exclusive. It's not just any way. And, and, and this was really highlighted to me several years ago when I was writing a thesis on life after, after death. And uh, uh, much of my study, I was really intrigued with the work of a man by the name of Dr. Raymond Moody, who happened to be a medical doctor and had a Ph.D., and he had studied over 3,000 cases of people that died and, and, and were brought back. They had what they called near-death experiences. And you know how you, you, you hear about all of these people having these near-death experiences. They, they, they die, their heart stops beating, and, uh, and then they have this experience of, of seeing this light and going through this tunnel and all of this. Well, as several of the experiences were very similar to that. But what struck me, and, 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 and I wrote about it years ago, and I still remember it was so vivid in me when, when, when I was doing the research. But this one man that was on the table, a middle-aged man that was dying of a massive heart attack, and he's on the table and, and, and he codes. And they shock him and, and bring, it, bring him back. And when they put the defibrillators on him, on his chest, and hollered out clear, pow! And now life bit and they got a heartbeat again. As soon as his heart came back, his eyes flung open and they were large as saucers. And he was screaming to the top of his voice saying, I'm in hell. I'm in hell. Doctor, please, don't let me go back to that place. Don't let me go back to that place. And all of a sudden, he, he lapses and his heart stops again. His words shook this Presbyterian doctor. They get the defibrillators out again. Clear. Pow. Bring him back again. Same story. Terrified. In this horrific experience. His eyes are as wide as saucers. He's not asking, am I going to live or am I going to die? He said, I'm in hell, doctor. Work. Do whatever you can do. Lord. Don't let me go back to that place. He didn't see a tunnel. He didn't see light. He didn't feel peace. He said, I'm in hell. I'm in hell. He slipped off again. Third time. Clear. Pow. They bring him back. He says, doctor grabs the doctor's arm. Doctor, pray for me. Pray for me. He had lived as though there was no God. 
But now he's saying, pray for me, doctor. Pray for me. Pray for my soul. He's an old Presbyterian doctor. He doesn't really know how. He's never led anybody to Jesus. But he formulates the best words that he can. And I just want you to know that God honors sincerity. No matter how polished. No matter how prepared. And he just prayed earnestly, God, Help him meet him at the place where he needs to be to come to know you. And he prayed his simple little prayer, and a peace came over the man's body, and he didn't code again. But nobody could tell this man that hell was not real. He was there. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord when you know Jesus. And his very hellish experience proved that not all roads lead there and I think that that side of the story needs to be told because we all hear about the tunnel and the light but there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain there is there is it's amazing Proverbs chapter 14 in verse 12 says this there is a path before each person that sings right but it's in it ends in death it ends in death it looks right there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. It ends in death. It ends in death. That's why you can't live your own truth. Because it might just look under you. You've got to live his truth. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Look at what our Lord Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. I want you to know that it, it says the, the, the road is difficult. Or uh, another version says confined. Confined. But here's what I want you to get. Faith does not mean that things are easy. It means that things are possible. When God calls you to do something by faith, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, but it means it's going to be possible. Faith makes things possible, not easy. And sometimes you're going to be called to blaze a trail, and other times you're called, you're called to follow. Sometimes you're called to follow a path, other times you're called to blaze a trail. That's called being a leader. Leader, leader, the word leader is an Indo-European word that comes from two separate words, L-E-A, which means path, and D-E-R, which means finder. You put them together, a leader is a path finder. So nobody's going to always just tell you which way to go. And that's why you don't get a manual from mama and daddy telling you how to act in every situation. You got to find your own path. You got to find the pathway. A leader is a pathfinder. Moses was a great leader, but the kind of battle that he was called to fight was different than the battle that Joshua was called to fight. Moses was a diplomat. Joshua was a warrior. Uh, Moses negotiated his way out of Egypt, but Joshua had to fight his way into the promised land because they had to dispossess people from the houses before they could possess it. You can't negotiate me out of my house talking about God sent you. Uh, that's going to be a little fireworks. Somebody's going to have to be prepared to die. So what worked for Moses couldn't work for Joshua. And so this is why Moses didn't give Joshua an instruction book. Moses basically told Joshua, Joshua, be strong and very courageous. The same God that was with, <laughs> with Moses, he's going to be with you. Trust him. Trust him. He led me by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I didn't know where we were going. And they walked in circles for 40 years. Moses just had to follow. He, just, he didn't have to say, Lord, are we there yet? Are we there yet? He had to follow. And so Joshua couldn't use those tactics. Joshua had to follow the same God. The one who is the way had to become his way maker. He didn't get an instruction book. He had to become a leader, a pathfinder. He had to find the path that God was leading him in. And this is why I said, you can't walk with God unless you learn to listen to God. 
You cannot walk with God unless you learn to listen to God. You cannot walk with God unless you learn to listen to God. And he brings us into a relationship of where we have to listen to him. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And there's sometimes that God will make you an innovator. And uh, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm the only one on my job. Maybe you shouldn't be the only one. Maybe you ought to be the first one. Maybe you ought to blaze a path and show others how you got there and what you did and what your faithfulness looked like, what your process looked like so that you empower others to be able to, to get there. Leave a trail, leave a trail, leave a trail. Abraham had to blaze a trail, a path where there was no path. He, had, he did what they had no testimony for. You know, some of the folks says they were, they were going, when the sun stood still and, and the Lord was, he caused the sun to stand still. They'd never heard of that. They had no scripture for that. It was a path blazer, blazing a trail. Moses uh, had to blaze a trail. Joshua had to blaze a trail. David had to blaze a trail. And God might call you to blaze some trails because you didn't get an instruction book. Paul didn't get an instruction book of how to spread the gospel in Ephesus, in Thessalonica, in Philadelphia, in, in, in Colossae, in Galatia. He, he didn't get an instruction manual. He just had to follow the voice of God. You can't walk with him if you don't listen to him. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, notice what the word of the Lord says. For the Lord grants wisdom. Thank God that he grants wisdom because God knows that we need it. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. That's what I love about honest people. They have common sense. Just honest. They have common sense. And notice this. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. And notice, he guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Not who are successful, who are faithful to him. Who are faithful to him. And here's what I want you to get from that. Don't just walk on a path for the sake of walking. Walk wisely. Walk integrously where uh, you, you, you have integrity in your heart. Integrity is where your behavior matches your belief. It's where your behavior matches your belief. Walk wisely, walk integrously, and walk thirdly faithfully. We learn that from Proverbs 2 verse 6 through 8. Walk wisely, walk integrously, walk faithfully. And that helps you with the path, the path, path that I use as an acrostic here. The P is principles, principles, principles. When you live your life by principle, 99% of your decisions are already made. Principle. I mean, sowing and reaping is a principle. That's a principle. So you, you reap what you sow. That's a principle of life. And he, but here's, here's what goes along with that. You, you reap what you sow. If you sow apples, you get apples. But here's another principle about re sowing and reaping. You reap more than you sow. And you reap later than you sow. They, they, these are principles about sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. But that's a principle. I, I love it in Proverbs chapter 2 verse 11. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you. That's a principle. Principles guide your life. They, they are the guardrails of our life. They are the guardrails. So principles. Path is about principles. The P is principles. You walk on this path with principles in your heart. Principles guided by principle. Guided by principle. Uh, number two, associations. Associations. Who you walk with determines where you end up. Birds of a feather not only flock together, they fly to the same destination. So your associations are very, very key. I want you to notice what the scripture talks about in Proverbs chapter 2 verse 19. Notice this, the man who visits her, and I just put this in here parenthetically so you could see this, the immoral promiscuous woman, if this is really a spirit because that could be a man, an immoral promiscuous man is doomed. The person who visits uh, the immoral person is doomed. He will never or she will never reach the paths of life. But now look at the next verse, Proverbs 2.20. 
follow the steps of good men instead and stay on the paths of righteousness. You see that? It says if you get with the immoral person, you'll never find the, the, the path of life. But if you follow the steps of good people and stay on that path of righteousness, that, that, that's where the blessing is. Positive associations make a positive difference in your life. Because who you, who you hang with matters. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And please send this to your children, your grandchildren. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's better to walk alone than in bad company. And uh, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, but associate with fools and get in trouble. I know you've been there. Sometimes you associated with the fool, sometimes you were the fool. When you're walking on this path, the P is principles. The A is association. The T, thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Programming determines feelings. Feelings determine thoughts thinking your thoughts and thoughts determine actions your thoughts your actions flow out of how you think your thinking flows out of how you feel it's amazing we don't do what we know we do we do what we feel like doing I mean you know that you should do so and so I know how to get up and clean this house up if you don't feel like it guess what thoughts follow feeling thoughts follow feeling I know I need to get up and clean this house but I don't feel like it guess what the dishes are going to be in the sink the clothes are going to be on the floor because you don't feel like it. Thoughts follow feelings. Feelings then produce actions. Guard your thoughts. Guard your thoughts because everything is really born in a thought. And if a thought is unspoken, it will die unborn. Notice what James chapter 1 verse 13 through 15 says in the Message Bible. Don't let anyone under pressure to give in to evil say, God's trying to trip me up. Because God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way. The temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. That baby is called sin. And sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. You see, lust is conceived in the thought life. In the thought you start thinking on it. And then the thought produces the act, and the act produces the lifestyle. But it starts as a thought. It produces it as a thought. That's why you have to guard your thoughts. On this journey, on the path, principles, association, guard your thoughts because everything begins with the passing thought. And the H are your habits. Habits. The habits. Good habits build a good life. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, notice this. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Again and again to your children. Again and again to your children because teaching is a process of repetition until learning occurs. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Teach them again. Do you see the repetition? He says, drill it in them, drill it in them. The word is like a hammer, and a hammer, you just pound it and pound it and pound it until you drive the nail in. You have to pound it and keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it. And there you are creating a path. You're reordering something, even in their brain, to create new habits. And neuroplasticity begins to happen in the brain. New pathways are happening. New habits are being established in the life. Principles, association, thoughts, and habits are the main foundations of your path. It was Will Durant, not, not uh, uh, Aristotle, who actually said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. It's a habit. It's a habit. We are what we repeatedly do. And my question to you today is, if you stay on the same path that you're on, where will you be 10 years from now? Where will you be in eternity? It's your decisions that make that, that determine that. And you have to find your whole identity in God and not in circumstances of life. Circumstances change, but who are you? Who are you? I mean, just because it's raining, does that, should that change who I am? 
It is not the water that tells the fish what it will become. It is not the soil that tells the seed what it will become. And neither should your environment tell you what you should become. Your identity should be rooted in God. We are who God says that we are. He has defined us according to his good pleasure. He makes himself known. And here's the great thing about paths. If you're on a wrong path, you can make a decision and get off of that wrong path and get on the right path with one decision. The old songwriter said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You hold the power to make that choice to change paths. You don't have to stay in the same career path if your job is making you sick. You have the power to change paths. If you don't want to be in this school, you can change paths. You can be in school and you'll have to change paths. I, I had to change majors while I was in school. It's okay to change paths, to get off of one path and on to another. There's a difference between changing paths and giving up. One is about getting right. The other one is about getting tired, getting frustrated. But I want to just to get right because I don't want to be on a table in an emergency medical situation asking somebody to pray for me. I want to pray my own prayers. I want to be able to decide for myself. I don't want to wait until I'm experiencing the flames of hell. And depending on possibly, maybe, that God would give me grace and give me some more time. Let me experience that to see that it's real. I, God says, blessed are those that believe and yet have not seen. I believe in hell with all of my heart. I, I believe in hell as strongly as I believe in heaven. To believe in one without the other is a travesty of justice. You cannot believe in good if there is no evil present. You cannot believe in light if there is no darkness. You cannot believe in truth if there is no lie. The one validates the other. You can be a sheep or a goat, light or darkness, good or evil. And he says, choose you this day. You get to choose the path of whether you're going to follow Jesus or whether you're going to follow your own lust. And you've seen that lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. And today, you could have been on the path leading you down that road toward death and destruction, lust, all of the sexuality in our culture, all of the drugs, all of the mind-altering things that we have going on, all of the warped ideologies, all of our secular humanism. And if you've been on a wrong path, trying to choose your own way and live your own truth, it's time to make a decision. To say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to get on the path that leads to life. Because it leads to God's presence. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. It's God's way of saying, I, I, I will do something fully in you. I'm going to make you whole. And until you're whole, you cannot be holy. Because sin is a manifestation of this warped imperfect sick nature that we are still trying to get validated still trying to feel loved still trying to feel accepted but when God makes you whole my God stop asking just to be healed the prayer ought to be God make me whole Jesus didn't say will you be healed he says wilt thou be made whole 
I want to heal your mind. I want to heal your emotions. I want to heal the memory of your past. I want to heal that feeling of rejection, that insecurity that's in you. I want to heal that so you can move forward with me and you can have loving relationships with people without treating them with suspicion and distrust. And you keep ruining your future relationship because you're reliving your past experience. And he's saying, you can make a choice to change paths. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.